welcome you, uh, not just to church as I did a few minutes ago, but let me welcome you into the eighth week of our study through what I think is going to be about a 12 or 13, maybe 14 week journey uh, through the first seven chapters of the book of Joshua. Over the last couple of months, we have been talking about and we will continue to talk about this idea of stepping into the promises of God. We're calling this teaching series, as you know, Every Step. And the idea is that as we move forward in our walk with the Lord, either as an individual Christian or as a family, a marriage, uh, as a church family, that as we step forward, that we can step confidently into the promises that God has made us. Now, way back in the beginning of this, of this um, teaching series, we spent a significant amount of time in chapter number one, identifying the fact that God has made promises to his people. And specifically, the promise that God has made to us is that he has promised us a life of blessing. Did you know this? God has said you can have a life of blessing. Now, the life of blessing that he promised to the Israelites, which is serving as our biblical example was a blessing that was connected to a land. We, we talked about this, right? I mean, it was very specific geographic borders. And God said, when you live in this land, the land of Canaan, then you can experience this blessing that I'm offering you. For us, it has nothing to do with a land. It has everything to do with our Lord. It's not a land of blessing. It's a life of blessing. It can happen anywhere I am. Because I can have an, a relationship with, a, with my Lord anywhere. But the blessing that Israel was promised is the same blessing that we have been promised. And that is the blessing of rest. And God said to the Israelites, when you live in this land, you can have rest. Jesus said to us, come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden. I will give you, say the word, give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. For I'm meek and lowly, and you shall find rest for your souls. He has promised us rest. And as we discovered, the word rest, the blessing of rest, means the blessing of peace. It's the idea that we can live a life, even in a chaotic and an upside-down world where there's burdens and difficulties and disappointments and struggles and, and stresses, that even in the midst of all of that, we can have a cessation of struggle in our lives. That we can begin to settle into a life filled with peace that the Bible says passes our ability to understand it. It's a tranquility or a peace that God has promised us. You have been promised, regardless of your circumstances, a life of rest. But we discovered early on that not everybody possesses that blessing. And here's why. Write this down. Just to remember this principle, that we discovered a promise is not a possession. A promise is only a promise. And a promise must be possessed. We must take possession of the promise that God has given us. And we do so by faith and obedience. Chapter 1 over and over. Be strong and of good courage. Trust me. Um, obey me. Don't turn to the right hand or the left hand uh, away from what I've told you to do. Obey me and trust me. Uh, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, the old hymn writer said, but to trust and obey. And so last weekend, we, we uh, came to chapter 4, where um, we discovered that having crossed the Jordan River, that was chapter 3, where they had Go Day, this epic moment where God parted the river and they crossed the Jordan on dry ground, entered into the land of Canaan for the very first time. In chapter 4... God had them build this 12-stone memorial. Do you remember that? Let me show it to you. Chapter 4 and verse number 3, where he says to them, I want you to send 12 men down into the riverbed, command them, saying, take you out of the midst of the Jordan. I'm in chapter 4, verse 3. Take out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, 12 stones. These are big stones one you'd carried on your shoulder. 12 stones, and you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night, you are to build a 12 stone memorial monument. And this monument, and again, these are 12 big stones, and so 12 of them together is going to make a large monument. And he says, This monument is going to be a mark 
on the landscape of Israel forever to remind you in future generations of the work that I did here. In fact, I hope you will remember uh, from chapter 4, verse number 6, look at it again, where he says that this monument, this 12-stone memorial, may be a sign among you. A sign among you. Here's the definition of sign. We learned it last week. A sign is a distinguishing mark, an identifying mark or an identifying feature. I want you to build this 12-stone monument so that it will be a mark on the landscape that I have done something profound right here. We talked about the fact that there ought to be some marks on our lives as well, right? Our lives should be marked with humility, as an example. Our lives should be marked with uh, worship, uh, as an example. Our lives should be marked with obedience to God's word. These are the distinguishing marks on the lives of God's people. Well, that's chapter 4. You've come into the land. You've now entered the land of rest, the land of blessing. Build this monument so that it will be a mark upon the the landscape. Now, today we come to chapter 5. In chapter number 5, God commands Joshua immediately upon their entrance into the land that he is to renew the Israelite right of circumcision. This is commanded in the Old Testament, and it is recommanded In Joshua chapter 5, let me take you there. Chapter 5, we'll just read a few verses. Look at verse 1. Joshua 5 verse 1 says, And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, which were on the side of the Jordan westward. So these are the people that lived uh, near uh, in the land near the Jordan River. All the kings of the Amorites. And then all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea. Now that's on the other side of of the country over near the Mediterranean Sea. That's... Where the Canaanites dwelt, when all the kings of the Amorites and all the kings of the Canaanites heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan River from before the children of Israel until we were passed over, that their heart did melt, neither was there any spirit or breath in them anymore because of the children of Israel. At that time, verse 2, at that time, the Lord said unto Joshua, Make sharp flint knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. Now, this is a national, this is a sort of a nationwide moment where they're going to obey this command. And it is the second time, the reason it says the second time, it is the second time that they've had this national moment where where it was uh, this this, um, act of circumcision was performed upon the men uh, at one time. Do this the second time. And then verse number 9, if you'll skip over to verse number 9, it says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. I want you to underline that. Many of you have your pens. I want you to underline that statement. Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. Now, It might make sense, you would think, that if you have just for the first time entered into enemy territory and the enemies have known that you were coming into the land, if you've for the very first time set your feet on enemy soil, you've crossed the front lines and you're in that enemy's land, it might make sense that you would commence the the attack right away, especially when you know that what verse 1 says is true, that all the kings of the Amorites and all the kings of the Canaanites, these seven nation states represented within the land of Canaan, have all lost hope because of the miracle that God had done. Do you see it in verse 1? That's exactly what it says. When they heard that God had dried up the waters of the Jordan River, their heart melted and there was no spirit left in them. Literally, the word spirit means breath. You ever had the breath knocked out of you and you just can't breathe? It's like the the word means that literally it took the wind out of their sails. It was was like a gut punch to all of the people living in Canaan. They knew that God was on the side of the Israelites. And wouldn't it have made sense to have said, if you're Joshua, General Joshua, hey, they've lost hope, let's go right now. Let's attack now. They'll lay their swords down and throw up their hands and surrender because they know that God has given us this land. That would make perfect military sense. And what would make no military sense at all 
would be that the very day that you enter into enemy territory and you need to be ready to fight, you perform a mass surgical procedure which is going to incapacitate your fighting army for at least a few days and make you vulnerable to attack. And I say both of those things simply to make it clear to all of us that what God commanded in verse number two made no sense militarily and it seemed to put his own people at risk. And you have to ask the question, why would God command that this would happen? Chapter number four, I command you, build a memorial that will be a mark on the landscape. Chapter number five, perform this rite that I have commanded you to perform that will be a mark upon your bodies. Now, why would God command the Israelites to do this the day that they move into the land of Canaan? The answer to that question really is pretty simple. And it is that if you were to go back to Genesis chapter 17, and don't turn now, we are going to go there in a minute, but... In Genesis 17, God is speaking to Abraham about the Abrahamic covenant. Now, by the way, let me stop for a second. If you were here way back in the beginning, two months ago, you will remember that we talked about the Abrahamic covenant. God, in Genesis 12 and 15 and 17, God enters into this covenant with Abraham. And in that relationship, that covenant relationship with Abraham, he basically says three things. He says, number one, I'm going to give you descendants, a son who will have a son who will have more sons, and this whole nation is going to come from you, okay? So that's part one. Part two, I'm going to give them a land, and your people, your children and grandchildren are going to live in this land. That's the land of Canaan. And the third part of that covenant was, I'm going to bless the whole world through you and your people in this land. And that has to do with salvation, which would ultimately come through Jesus. So all of that happens back in Genesis. In Genesis 17 and verse number 11, God says to Abraham, Now the seal or the mark of this covenant that I have made with you is going to be the sign of circumcision. This is going to be the mark on your body that you and I are in covenant together. And God was so serious about this command that he specifically commanded that every male child born into Israel would be circumcised on the eighth day of his life. This was performed by Mary and Joseph uh, on Jesus when he was eight days old. Uh, the Bible tells us in, in Matthew and in Luke uh, and is, is performed even until today. Now, while God commanded this as the mark of the covenant, and while it was specifically commanded that it would be performed throughout the nation, and it would be performed generationally as more and more generations were born, every boy would, would be marked in this way. The fact of the matter is that God was much more interested in the mark upon their hearts than he was upon the, mar the mark upon their bodies. What God was wanting them to know was that the external mark of circumcision truly is to represent an internal transformation that's taking place in your heart. And in fact, the Bible says this in the New Testament in repeated places. Let me just show you one verse, Romans 2.29, which says, But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the law. Now, this verse doesn't discount the command for Jewish boys to be circumcised, but what it does say is that God is more interested in the heart uh, and what the Spirit of God does in our hearts than he is uh, in what the law requires externally. And so, as Israel enters the land of Canaan in Joshua chapter number 3, immediately in chapter 5, God says, I want you to renew this covenant with me. I want us to renew our covenant relationship. Now, why did God want them to renew the covenant relationship? Why had it become distant? The answer to that question very simply is discovered in chapter 5. I'm not going to read it all to you. You can go read it later. But essentially what he says in chapter 5 is this. That during the 40 years that the Israelites wandered in the wilderness, their parents, the parents of these men who are now entering the land, their parents had failed to follow through on this command. They had not 
uh, obeyed the command when a child, a male child would be born, eighth day would come and go. They, they were not interested. They didn't care. Uh, they were not attentive to this command. And so this generation had grown up without this command of circumcision being obeyed. Uh, in the wilderness during those 40 years, uh, the Israelites were not living out their covenant relationship with God. They were living shy or underneath their covenant privileges. And it was almost like, and I want you to hear this very carefully, it was almost like they were still living in the land of Egypt. Even though they had been set free from bondage, from slavery, they still were not living to the, to the level, living to the privilege of their covenant relationship that they could have been living. So upon entering the land, God says, I want to renew our relationship. And I want you to notice verse 9. I asked you to underline this a moment ago. But in verse number 9, upon doing this, he says, The Lord said unto Joshua, Today, um, let, let, let me insert, in this covenant renewal, in your following through with this command, in, in renewing our covenant, I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. If y'all are listening, if you're still with me, say amen. I don't want you to miss this. It's been 40 years, do you hear me, since they came out of Egypt. They have not dwelt in Egypt in four decades, in a generation. And God says, even though it's been 40 years, today I am just now, finally, the reproach of Egypt is being rolled away off of you. The word reproach means this. Write the definition down. It means disgrace. The disgrace of Egypt or the shame of Egypt. And specifically, the word reproach means a disgrace or a shame, a reproach that can be placed upon you by others. In essence, what God is saying is, look, you are my people and you have been my people since Genesis chapter 12, since I called Abraham into this covenant. You've been my people throughout all of your time, 400 years in Egypt. You've been my people over the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. You are my people, but for far too long, there has been a disgrace upon your life. You belong to me, but for far too long, people have been able to reproach you. They have been able to scorn you because of the disgrace of Egypt upon your life. And all of those years living in bondage in Egypt, even though you were mine, people were able to reproach and scorn you because of your bondage. And even for the last 40 years wandering in the wilderness aimlessly, purposely, even though you were freed from Egypt, still there was a, a disgrace and a reproach because you still were not living up to your covenant relationship. But today, God says, today, verse number 9, you have entered into the land. And today, you have begun to renew our covenant relationship. And today, are you with me? God says, I am taking the disgrace of Egypt off of your life. The shame is gone. The relationship is renewed. And you and I are walking in fellowship again. If you have believed that it's grace and mercy that God would take the reproach away, would you say amen? It's absolute mercy. God says, today, I am rolling away the reproach of Egypt. In the same way, when you and I have been freed from sin, from Egypt, if you will. Egypt is a type of the world. When we've been delivered through the salvation of our Passover lamb, the Israelites came out of Egypt because the Passover lamb died, that the wrath of God would pass over them. And in the same way, Jesus, our Passover lamb, died so that the wrath of God might be removed and we could be set free from the slavery of sin. And when we have been set free from the world and from sin, and yet we still live lives immersed in the world. When we have been set free in Christ and we still live lives guided and directed and prioritized by the philosophies and the thinking of this world. When we live lives entrenched in, immersed in the world, can I tell you what it is? 
It is a reproach to the name of Christ. It is a disgrace. It is a shame that brings scorn upon the people of God and ultimately scorn upon the name of Christ. When we call ourselves Christ followers and yet we live like Christ deniers. I don't mean that we're atheists, but I mean that our lives represent the same kinds of philosophies as those who deny Christ as their Lord. We, we put the glory of God and the fame of Jesus four, five, six ticks mark, marks down on our list of priorities in our decision-making process. When we care little to nothing for the glory of God or the furtherance of the gospel or the fame of Jesus... When we live lives that care nothing about brothers and sisters in Christ and building them up and care only about ourselves, I will say to you plainly, it is a shame. And it is a reproach. And God says to us, what you need is what the Israelites needed. You need a covenant renewal. I would say it this way, we need personal revival. And I would encourage you to know that in the same way that Israel needed personal revival, I believe that many of us need this kind of personal revival. When God would say to us through that personal revival, today I am carrying away the shame of off, off of your life. When we would find that God would remove the reproach and the disgrace off of our lives. Now the question then becomes, well, how do we find that kind of covenant renewal? How do, we, how do we discover and experience that kind of personal revival? Well, I believe the answers are really simple, and, I've, and I've, I'm convinced that they are contained in the text. And so let me give you those answers uh, as we move toward making some personal application of this. All right, so write this down, if you will. The first thing we must do is realize that personal revival is really just coming home, that if I acknowledge, if I admit that though I claim Christ and have been delivered from sin and the world, and yet my life uh, has been marked more by the world than by Christ and his commands, and if my life has taken on a reproach either uh, privately or publicly, that I can know that personal revival is, is really simple. It's just a matter of coming home. Notice with me verse number 2, when God called them to renew their covenant relationship. Verse 2 says, this is when God commanded them, at that time. At that time, God said, we needed to renew our relationship. Well, what time? At the time that is described in verse number 1. The time when God parted the river, they crossed over on dry land, and for the very first time, they are standing, their sandals are standing on the soil of the land of Canaan that God has promised to them. In chapter number 3, they came home. And God said, welcome home. Let's renew our relationship. Now, some of you may be thinking, wait, 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 wait. How are you saying they came home because they've never been here before? They don't even possess the land yet. This is not their home yet. How can you say that they have come home? Well, let me show you how I can say it. Hold your finger in Joshua chapter 5. Go to Genesis 17. I mentioned this passage a moment ago. All the way back to the beginning of your Bible. Look at Genesis 17 and verse number 11. Genesis, uh, not ver 11, verse 8. Genesis 17 and verse number 8. So Abraham has been called into this covenant relationship with God. And God says to him in chapter 17, verse 8, And I will give unto thee, and your seed or your children, your generations after thee, the land wherein you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Now, hang with me for a minute. So in Genesis 12, God calls Abraham to leave his homeland, which is over in the modern-day Iraq. He says, I want you to leave where you are and go into this new land. So he begins to follow him, and he ends up in the land of Canaan. And while he's standing in chapter 17, verse 8, in the land of Canaan, God says to him, look around. 
This is your homeland. Now, you don't possess it yet. I'm going to give it to your descendants. But the land where you are a stranger is going to be their homeland. Abraham had been there. Now, the second question that rises in my mind, at least, and I hope it will in yours, is where in the land of Canaan, because though it's a small country, I mean, it's a a good-sized piece of land, where in the land of Canaan did God say to Abraham, I'm going to give this land to your descendants. This will be their home. Well, we have an idea, at least. Go back to chapter 14, Genesis 14, and look at what the Bible says in verse number 17. I'm in Genesis 14, verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him. That's Abraham. The king of Sodom went out to meet Abraham. Where did they meet? Look at the end of verse 17. At the valley of Shavech, which is, in the, which is the king's dale or the king's valley. Abraham in chapter 14, verse number uh, 17, is in a place, a valley called the king's valley or the valley of the king's. And this is the same location where he was apparently still in chapter 17 when God says to him, I'm going to give your people this land. Now, we know exactly where the Valley of the Kings is at. We know exactly where it's at. And it is in Jerusalem. If you go look at a picture of Jerusalem, you'll see the Temple Mount here. You'll see the Mount of Olives right next to it here. And the valley between the Temple Mount, Mount Moriah, and the Mount of Olives, that valley is the King's Valley, the Valley of Shavech. And this is where Abraham was standing in chapter 14. I believe he was still in that area in chapter number 17. Something very interesting happened, by the way, in chapter 14 when when Abraham is in that valley of the kings there at Jerusalem. Look at what happens. Look at verse 18. Chapter 14 of Genesis, verse 18. If you all still with me, say amen. Look at verse 18. And Melchizedek. Do you know this name? Melchizedek. If you've read your Bible very much, you've, you've heard this name. Maybe you've wondered about this sort of uh, sh- uh, shadowy, seemingly mysterious figure by the name of Melchizedek. Well, look at what verse 18 says. Melchizedek, who was the king of Salem. Now, I should tell you that Salem is the same as Jerusalem. So Salem would have been the name before it was called Jerusalem. Jerusalem is Yerushalom, the city of God's peace. Salem, Shalom means peace. Melchizedek was the king of Salem or the king of Jerusalem. He came when Abraham was down in the valley of kings. He comes down from Mount Moriah, Mount Zion, into that valley, and he brings to Abraham bread and wine. Interesting. So this king of Jerusalem comes and meets Abraham. Abraham's never met him as far as we know. He comes into this valley, and he offers to Abraham bread and wine. He goes on to say in verse number 18, and he, Melchizedek, was the priest of the Most High God. Well, now, if you, if you know your Old Testament, you're going to, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. He was a priest, but the priesthood had not even been established yet. There was no such thing as a Jewish priest in Genesis chapter 14. Abraham is in Genesis 14. Hang with me. Abraham's in Genesis 14. He's going to have a son named Isaac, who's going to have a son named Jacob, who's going to have a son named Levi, and the sons of Levi are going to become the Jewish priests. This, Genesis 14, is four generations before the Jewish priesthood, the Levitical priesthood, and he is called the priest of the Most High God. Well, who is Melchizedek? I'm so glad you asked that question. Go with me to the New Testament, if you will. Go all the way to the book of Hebrews, chapter number 7. Right near the back of your Bible, not too far in front of the book of Revelation, you'll come to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 7 describes the event that we just read about in Genesis 14. Look at Hebrews 7, beginning in verse 1. I may bust before we get through it. Listen to this. Verse number one, for this Melchizedek, there he is again, for this Melchizedek was the king of Salem, that's what Genesis 14 told us, the king of Jerusalem. He is the priest of the most high God, that's what Genesis 14 told us, the priest of the most high God. He met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings in the valley of Shavek, that's that's what Genesis 14 told us, and he blessed him. How did he bless him? He blessed him by bringing him bread and wine, to whom also Abraham Gave a tithe, a tenth part of everything. Now listen to this description. 
of Melchizedek. First, being by interpretation the king of righteousness. Melchizedek is called the priest of the Most High God and the king of Jerusalem and the king of righteousness. He's also, verse 2 says, the king of Salem, which means he is the king of peace or the prince of peace. Who is Melchizedek? He is the priest of the Most High God to whom Abraham paid tithes. He is the king of Jerusalem and the prince of peace. Y'all tracking with me? Look at verse 3. Melchizedek is without father. He is without mother. He is without descent. You can't track his genealogy. He doesn't have a beginning of days nor an end of life, but he is made like unto the most high God. He abides a priest forever and forever. Let's be clear. Who is Melchizedek? As far as I'm concerned, it is none other than Jesus Christ our Lord. And in Genesis 14, Abraham comes up. He's been in this covenant with God now. He comes up to the Valley of the Kings. Melchizedek, I believe Jesus, comes down off the mountain and offers him what? Bread and wine. And do you remember that when Jesus gathered on the night of his arrest with his disciples, where? Just above the Valley of the Kings on Mount Zion, he offered to his disciples as the sign of the covenant bread and wine. And wine in communion. Melchizedek comes. He brings Abraham this bread and wine. He greets him and blesses him there. Welcomes him into the land, which is the land of the covenant that he's entered into with God. And he blesses him in that place. And if you fast forward from there, chapter 17, verse 8, God says, I'm going to give this land to you. Well, it doesn't take too long after that that Abraham and his family ultimately end up out of Canaan. They end up in Egypt. 400 years pass while they're in Egypt. Ultimately, they become slaves in Egypt. After, after being slaves in Egypt, they're delivered by Moses. They come out of the land of Egypt, and for 40 years, they wander around in the wilderness living beneath the covenant privilege that they have been given through Melchizedek. And one day, God brings them to the border of the Jordan River. He parts the river. They walk over into the land. And as soon as the river closes behind them, God says, Welcome home. Let's renew our covenant. And I believe the place where their feet were standing in Joshua chapter number 5 is within 10, 12 miles of the very place where Abraham's feet were standing when Melchizedek gave him bread and wine for the covenant. I'm simply saying this to you, that coming into this covenant renewal, this personal revival, is simply about coming home. It's coming home to Jesus. In Luke chapter number 15, Jesus tells the wonderful story of the prodigal. And the prodigal who wanders away from his father and in sinful rebellion and selfishness and selfish desires goes and wastes the years of his life and destroys his testimony and drags the family name down and breaks the heart of his father. And one day, sitting in the pig pen, he says, you know, in my father's house, my my father's servants have plenty to eat. And I could go home to my father. I don't deserve to go home to my father, but I could. He's a good man. I know he would welcome me back. And I could just say, I don't even deserve to be your son. But let me just be a hired servant in your home. And so he gets up. And where does he go? He goes home. And when he gets home, he says, hey, Dad, I can't even, I can't even be your son anymore. But I could just really use a job. And would you hire me? And his dad says, are you kidding me? Go get the robe and go get the ring and put the shoes on his feet and kill the calf because my son was dead. And the father says he's come home. He's alive. And he falls on his neck and he kisses him. And he says, my son has come home. Here's what I want to say to you. Your life has become a reproach, either privately or publicly. It's simply one step home. And when you come home, God says, I will take the shame of the weeks or the months or the years, and I will roll it away. And no one will ever cast scorn on you again, because I will take the reproach away. Just come home. Personal revival ultimately 
It was about coming home. The second thing that this text, and I'm back in Joshua 5, the second thing that this text tells us about personal revival is that we need to know that personal revival is ultimately my personal responsibility. This is pretty important. Because if you notice the command in verse number 2, and if you read on down through verse 6, verse number 7, it describes how that the Israelites during the wilderness wanderings had not circumcised their boys at eight days old. And so these guys grew up and they, they, they never followed this command, this sign of the covenant. And you come to chapter 5, verse 2, and Joshua says, okay, it's time. We're going to renew this covenant. And they could have protested, right? I mean, these guys could have said, wait, 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 wait. It's not our fault. And we couldn't help it. It's our parents. They're, they're the ones who didn't do what they should have done. We were eight days old. We, we had no control over what happened to us when we were eight days old. How could we now be held responsible for needing to seek personal revival? It's not our responsibility, and yet it was. Listen to me carefully. Some of you in this room, I believe it's true. Generally speaking, for all of your life, the the expression of your Christian faith, the, your, your walk with God has been largely determined by the decisions made by your parents. You are who you are. You believe what you say you believe. You even are here today. Maybe if you're a, a student, a teenager, a, a college student, a young adult, and, and essentially you're here today not because you love Jesus and you want to walk in a covenant relationship with him. You're just here because it's just what you've been taught to do your whole life. This is what your parents did. And you need to hear your pastor say to you today that personal revival means you own your relationship with God. It's up to you. But wait a minute, pastor. I didn't, I didn't, it's just what I was, no, it's yours now. And you have to own it. Some of us here have made and are making life decisions that do not square with what we say we believe. And we know that the decisions that we are making bring reproach to the name of Christ. And yet we are blaming our decisions on the actions of somebody else. Well, this person did that, and that caused the other, and because of that, I've had to, and I've done this because of them. I want to tell you something. You will never experience personal renewal until you go, you know what? It's up to me. i got to go home because I am responsible for my walk with God. And the third and final thing that this passage tells us about personal revival, write it down, is that personal revival is about trusting God's grace. Now, without getting too graphic, can we just agree together that the command of verse 2, make sharp knives and circumcise all the men of Israel, can we agree? That's going to cause some pain in Israel. Amen? And here's what you have to know, that personal revival is going to bring some pain into your life. Now, I know we don't like to hear this, but it's going to bring some pain. And the pain is described with this word, repentance. Repentance. See, if you're going to have personal revival, here's what you're going to have to allow God to do. You're going to have to allow God to cut some things out of your life that are deeply rooted and entrenched, and they ought not be there, and it's going to be a painful separation from those things, or people maybe. But you'll never experience personal revival until you let God cut it away. It's repentance. God, do what you have to do. I am coming home to you. That's repentance. The second part, though, is that not only did they experience pain, I I think it's a safe bet to say there was some weeping going on in the camp. There was some crying going on. The Bible calls that godly sorrow. Or another word is conviction. You see, if y'all are listening, say amen. We live in an age when you can go to 90%, I don't want to say 90%, maybe that's an overstatement. You can go to a lot of churches. And you can, you can go week after week after week and never be touched with the twinge of conviction. Conviction is when we weep over our wrongs. It is when we express godly sorrow and we say, my life, having been set free by Christ, should not be a reproach. It should not be a disgrace for Christ. And where there is sin, I should say, oh God, 
forgive me. And there should be godly sorrow. Last night after our Saturday night service, I was met at this altar by a man with tears dripping off his cheeks under conviction for the fact that he said, I need revival. Oh, that God would give us tears in the rows of the church again over sin and shameful living that brings reproach to the name of Christ. Come home. Weep over your sins and God will remove the shame and bring renewal. And then there's one last thing. That this idea of personal revival means trusting God's grace means that, yeah, I I do have to let God cut some things away and that's going to be painful and I might weep over that. But revival means trusting God to cover me with his healing. You see this in verse number 8. When after this procedure had taken place, it says they all stayed in their tents and their places in the camp until they were whole. God brought healing to them. See, some of us have thought, well, I went to a service and and I said, God, I'm sorry for my sins. And I prayed a quick prayer and I went back out the door and I changed nothing. I think I had revival. No, you didn't. Because revival is more than praying a prayer. Revival is allowing God, if you're listening, say amen, to take me through the process of transforming my life into what he wants it to be. And it doesn't usually happen overnight. It begins with repentance and godly sorrow, and then it's a process of God bringing his healing grace in my life. And I believe that gathered in this room today, just like there was last night and there will be two more times today, are people who need to admit privately, publicly, secretly, little ways, big ways, Though I am a Christ follower, my life has become a reproach to Christ. And I need revival in my life. I hope, I hope you will seek it.